Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the Cryptoverse. Today, we're gonna to talk about Bitcoin, the beauty of mathematics, part 35. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and also check out Into the Cryptoverse Premium at intothecryptoverse.com. I did wanna let you guys know that I will be at Bitcoin Miami this year, so I look forward to meeting you, whoever, whoever is able to go to that. And at some point, I'm gonna to try to have a, a meet and greet in one of the rooms, so do be on the lookout for that. I'll provide more details if I can if I can work something out so that I can I can meet some of the people who have watched the channel. Um, I do recognize that after I polled everyone, that a lot of you would uh, would say that my wife does a better job at presenting this series. So maybe maybe she should take it over after twenty one thousand votes came in. Uh, Seventy percent of people say that she does a better job at presenting the Bitcoin Beauty of Mathematics video series than me. Uh, so I might, I might be out of a job soon. I might be another, uh, another statistic on the um, unemployment rate. But anyways, I, I will take it at least for this month just to see, just sort of see where we are here. As of, as of May 1st, really it's May 2nd, but as of May 1st, the total market cap of crypto is at 1.162 trillion. Whereas the fair value is is at approximately 2.012 trillion, this represents an undervaluation of approximately 42%. Now, if you're unfamiliar with this video series, this is actually of the total cryptocurrency market capitalization, not just of Bitcoin. The whole idea is that if you fit all of the data, there is a fair value of crypto that we can more or less extract. And again, the fair value right now, according to this type of analysis, is approximately $2 trillion. Now, that doesn't mean that crypto's market cap will reach $2 trillion this year. I would argue that we're likely going to spend the entire year below the red regression line and above the lower green one. We might deviate outside of either of them at some point this year briefly, but there's no guarantees that even happens. I would just say we're likely going to spend, you know, at least 90 to 95% of the year between these two logarithmic aggression trend lines. This is historically what we do during, you know, pre-having years. Now there was an example in 2019 where we sort of popped our head above it for a few months, but it was it was relatively short-lived and then we we ended up fading that move in the second half of the year. Furthermore, if you go back to 2015, we essentially we essentially spent all of 2015 all of 2016 and even early 2017 below the fair value regression trend line. And again, the fair value right now is $2 trillion. So it could still be, you know, uh, quite a while before we get back above the fair value in a more sustained way. I mean, if, again, if, if you include, say, a two to three month move, then, you know, then it might not take as long. But if you're talking about a move that really gets you moving above the fair value and has a realistic chance to go to closer to the upper green logarithmic regression trend line, you're still likely looking at, you know, uh, more so a 2024, 2025 type thing, not, not a likely 2023 outcome, if I had to speculate dubiously, of course. Um, but that is at least something to consider. One thing I also wanted to mention, again, is that you always need to consider where is the fair value and what is the reference point? Because there's this thing where, you can go to prior levels, you know, prior prices, but be technically more undervalued. There's a great example here in 2015. I mean, you know, on the first capitulation down in early 2015, we were not very undervalued. You can see how close we were to lower the red fair value. But by, this, the, by Q3 of 2015, or the pre-having year, we had a double bottom, but it was technically more undervalued because the fair value had increased during that pot time from around four and a half billion to around nine billion. So the fair value had gone up approximately two X. One way to visualize this is to take the percent difference between the market cap of crypto and the fair value. And you get something that looks like this. And you will see that in late 2015, we came down you know, to, to uh, at least 60% undervalued, if not slightly more. Very similar type of thing happened in March of 2020 where we came pretty undervalued. So far, we've gone down about, you know, maybe about 50, 55% undervalued. Again, still fairly undervalued back in, in November and December. Um, but it, I mean, it doesn't mean that we can't eventually retest those areas. And if we do, at the very least, then we would be more undervalued today or in three months or in six months than we were at the end of 2022. If you think about it, 
the fair value back in November, December 2022 was around 1.7 trillion. But again, the fair value today is already over 2 trillion. So just revisiting those levels would be more undervalued today than it was back then because we assume that the cryptoverse as a whole is increasing in value due to growing adoption as the years continue to go on, okay? So, you know, in general, you should think of times like this, and we say this in every single Beauty of Mathematics video series, right? These, these, you know, sort of the end of the bear market year, you know, 2014, 2018, 2022, and then throughout the entire, you know, pre-having year, and even in the early having years, right? That's not, a, that, that, that's, that's the general time that long-term accumulation should take place, right? That's when it should theoretically take place. At some point during that time, right, like the end of 2022 to before the next halving is, is generally like the, the window of opportunity. And I've said before, right, the best strategy often is a DCA strategy. And again, that's the only strategy I use for Bitcoin. I'm, I'm more picky about the altcoin market because I, I know that they, they tend to bleed back to Bitcoin during you know during the pre-having years and even the early phases of the having years which is why you continue to see me sort of you know put up a stand against the altcoin market um but that doesn't mean that eventually we won't get to the point where they are um more undervalued against um more undervalued to against bitcoin than they are today right i, I still think they are fighting an uphill battle and I, I do think there's some element of a rotation of capital when when we sort of go through this phase if you think about it the market cap of crypto over the next six months, perhaps six months from now, the market cap's the same as it is today, but it could be a rotation of capital from, you know, higher risk plays to lower risk plays as people just seek out relative safety. It's the same kind of thing that we're seeing going on in tech stocks and in, in high market cap tech stocks. It's the, it's the, you know, the Facebook and the Amazon and the Google and the Apple. It's those stocks that are really propping the index up, not the, not the lower market cap ones. Um, and, and maybe this is seen as a flight to safety in, 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 in tech as well to the sort of the higher market cap plays. Perhaps it's a, it's a way to, for people to sort of say that, hey, these larger market cap companies have a more realistic chance to sort of survive any, of, any potential recession that comes our way, whereas some of the other companies might not. Um, perhaps that's one way, one way to look at it. And I, I think you're seeing something very similar going on in crypto at the current time. Um, that's represented just by you know the dominance of Bitcoin and and um, even the even the blue chip dominance where you combine Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, they've been going up for for quite some time. And now again, if you if you do take the percent difference between the total market cap and the fair value, you get something that looks like this. So we're still at at relatively low levels here. Um, I mean, in 2015, we spent a long time sort of just scraping the lows. And, and this, this does accomplish something. It, it allows sort of the social risk to really reset and, and for us to gear up for a, a future cycle. But I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that you can spend a long time in this phase. I mean, I know, I know crypto just had a rally for the last few months off of the lows, but it's still relatively low here. And 2015 shows that we actually spent a decent amount of time in this range, right? I mean, in this range, in 2019 and 2020, you can see we, we went up pretty quickly, but then it was faded for basically the next nine months. Um, but in both scenarios, we, you know, we eventually became more undervalued um, than we were, uh, say, at the at the tail end of, the, of, of the, the primary bear market year. For instance, at the end of the bear market year of 2014, we were only just barely undervalued. And it was as we continue to go through 2015 that we reached really deep levels of undervaluation. Um, here, you can see that more so corresponded to going uh, to, the, to the June capitulation. And then ever since then, we've sort of just been, you know, we, we continued to trend down out into, uh, out into the fourth quarter. But now I would argue that we're just in some long, boring phase like this. And that's likely going to be um, sort of seen as just more or less staying below the red line the red logger and the regression trend line, again, a monotonically increasing function and above the green re regression trend line for 90 to 95% of this year, if I had to guess. Now, the lower band on this is currently at approximately 600 billion. So the lower band is at 600 billion. The fair value is around 2 trillion. Um, and I, I've thought about two different things. I, I've thought about maybe two useful exercises at some point this year would be to refit this or not, not to refit this, but to, to fit 
the market cap, excluding stables, that might give us some more insight. Um, and to also uh, potentially revisit the upper logarithmic regression trend line and, and perhaps refit it to sort of these peaks over here so that it can ha perhaps act as a better guide out in, say, a, a future cycle where we're going back to the overvaluation territory. Again, I think that the phase to reach real overvaluation above just, say, a, a very brief period is still over a year away. Um, so I think I do think we have time to get there. If you followed the, the, the channel here the last few days, we've gone over the social risk, the on-chain risk, and the price risk. We then combine those in the to, into the total indicator risk or the summary risk. And it's a, it's a worthwhile exercise as well to sort of overlay the summary risk, which again includes price, on-chain, and social risk onto this chart. And this has got to be one of my favorite charts uh, for crypto um, that, that we sort of created here on, on the end of the Cryptoverse website, just so you can really see the ebb and flow of the cryptoverse, right? The periods of fear and, and uncertainty, and then these periods of greed, and how there's just this ebb and flow from one to the other. And you can see again that we spend a lot more time at lower risk levels than we do at high risk levels. In the grand scheme of things, what happens in crypto is we spend years at low risk levels, and then a few weeks, a few months at the high risk levels. And you could argue that we've been at low risk levels ever since June of 2022. So we're coming up on a year of being at relatively low risk levels when accounting for the total summary risk. Over here, you can see that we were at low risk levels essentially from you know September of 2014 until May of 2017. I mean, you're talking about two and a half years. So this is you know, this is what crypto does. We 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 are undervalued for really long periods of time. Everyone starts to lose interest. The halving occurs, we go back to, to more favorable monetary policy, and, and what happens, right? Everything just comes back, and we go back into this greedy phase, and we get a lot of tourists that come back into the cryptoverse, and then there's at least every cycle, we bring in more people. Most of those people leave, but a percentage of them stay, and they stick around, and it's those people that stick around that really get to reap the benefits in the future. So, you know, my general recommendation, not financial advice, of course, is that, you know, between sort of the the end of 2022, right, the tail end of 2022, but before the next halving um, is is sort of the is sort of the window, right? And it, I mean, again, like it, timing is really hard. Uh, a DCA strategy, I will always say, is going to be the best strategy to sort of carry out within crypto, and I've I've been try to be as transparent as I can. What I'm interested in right now, I think Bitcoin dominance is likely going higher. Um, so there's not really a whole lot of interest for me in the altcoin market. And and if Bitcoin USD goes back down and retests the lows, uh, kind of like it did or it almost did back in, in the last cycle on how it did back in 2015, we know what happens to the altcoin market during that phase. And so, yes, the market cap could could sort of go back down. But you could see a deviation, or a, sorry, a, a, a sort of a redistribution of capital from lower risk plays, or sorry, from, from higher risk plays to lower risk plays. And, and then what normally happens is then Bitcoin leads out into, into the next bull market, okay? Like, and I mean like a more of a sustained one. I'm not talking about like a 2019 rally or a mid-2015 rally. We're talking about the real rallies that take you up to a new paradigm shift, right? A new... Um, what does it mean to own one Bitcoin or, or 0.1 Bitcoin or 0.01 Bitcoin, right? It, it changes every cycle what that what that really means. And so um, that's where we currently stand. I mean, I, I, I do think that there's a good chance that at some point this year, we will revisit some of these lower valuations, uh, just like we have really almost always done, you know? And um, I don't really think this time will be any different. And of course, the, the goal is for us to eventually hit 10 trillion, ideally next cycle. But of course, we're going to have to say somewhat, um, you know, nimble, as, as Powell would say, right, on, in terms of our, our perception of it, that, if that's a possibility. I think a lot of it will depend on, on if inflation comes back or if it doesn't. Uh, if it doesn't, then it's a, it's a possibility next cycle. If it does come back, then it, it could lead to sort of a, a, a tempered return, just kind of like we had here where we didn't go back all the way up to the top there. So just something to think about. Ideally, 10 trillion is the goal, plus or minus a few trillion. And as we go to sleep at night, we cannot help but wonder what's a few trillion dollars among friends. Thank you guys for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe, give the video a thumbs up, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.